if everybody could type into the chat instead of speaking, who are the people of Hamlet's generation in the play? The people who are approximately his age. They can unmute, you can unmute and speak. Or unmute and speak, that, that works fine too. Just call out, I'm not gonna call on you, although I can see if you raise your hand, it will show me if you use the hand raising on Zoom. Okay, Horatio Laertes and his two stupid friends. So, okay, I'm talking about Shakespeare's Hamlet. So, I'm talking about, uh, so who are the, who are the stupid friends in Shakespeare's Hamlet? We're not talking about Mamdo Hadwen yet. Laertes, can you hear me? Laertes. Laertes, like. Laertes, the dog. The the same age. Okay, so we have Laertes. Uh, I Ophelia, Ophelia, uh, Ophelia, like, uh, was of the same age. Ophelia, yeah, doctor, I, I want to hear the students. Okay. <laughs> okay, good. Maybe Anybody York? else? Yeah, maybe York, because he was playing with him in his child help, you know. He was jumping and joking. So Yorick, is he, uh, is he Hamlet's age or is he more like a father figure? He's way older than Hamlet. Yeah. Okay, so we'll call him a father. Um, yeah. Any other people Hamlet's age? What about uh, who ends oh, the play? Who gets the last line of the play? Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. They're, they're, uh, we have Rosencrantz and Guildenstern on our list. Uh, yeah, okay. Who else? Um, because who ends the play? Who gets the very last line? Horatio. Uh, Horatio. Fortinbras. Oh, Fortinbras. Fortinbras. Very good. Okay. So Fortinbras. And, so and of course, we do have Horatio. He is another age mate of Hamlet. And we have somebody said Ophelia. Can I say something about Horatio? Real yeah, go ahead. So I, I saw this guy on YouTube and his theory was like, he's a, he seems like a conspiracy theorist. And what he said was so interesting. So he said that uh, in the play, Horatio says um, that he saw King Hamlet, the father, uh, when he was battling um, old Fortinbras. And that was 30 years ago. So he's, he, he was suggesting that Horatio is way older than Hamlet. He's more like a father figure. Because how would he know that? He, he said he was wearing this and this. How would he know that? Uh, I think he said, I saw him once when he, uh, the, the, the something Fortinbras combated. When he Unlike smote that. the Polacks on the ice. Oh, yeah. So, you know, I don't know if he saw him or heard about him or why that. Hamlet was not there during this battle. Um, that happened when he was a tiny child, but Horatio was. I know Horatio is very un, unevenly represented. There are lots of mysteries about Horatio. Yeah, By yeah. the end of the play, he's like Hamlet's best friend. And in the beginning, Hamlet doesn't even remember his name. He sees him and he says, ah, who are you? You must be Horatio or I forget myself. Remember this? So Horatio serves a purpose for Shakespeare and I don't think Shakespeare really, I know, I'm sorry, this is blasphemy against the bard, but I don't think Shakespeare really thought through the whole Horatio story because it comes and goes. However he needs it, that's how he uses it. First he's a stranger and then he's his best buddy. But I wanna talk about this generation thing. So who are the father figures? Banan typed um, old Hamlet, the ghost. Polonius, Claudius, we also have Yorick. So that's a lot of father figures that Hamlet has. Um, let's be more specific. What does the ghost, old Hamlet, the dead Hamlet, what does he want him to do? Go ahead and unmute yourself and speak. He wants him to take revenge, says Khaled to kill his uncle. Okay, perfect. Um, and 
does he want him to take a quiet sort of careful revenge the ghost Sarah, go ahead say more not quiet hasty revenge um okay so the ghost wants we understand he wants a bloodbath right he wants a revenge tragedy where the truth is announced, um, where the revenge comes and it's, it's bloody and it's dramatic and Claudius can't run away. What does Polonius want? He's another kind of father figure in this play. He's not a father to Hamlet. But he is he a father friends. to Hamlet's girlfriend. Ophelia, what does he want? He wants praise and he wants his status uh, in the court. We're talking about Polonius. He wants status. Yeah, he wants praise. He's the, like, the wazir. He, he wants um, attention. He wants power, this kind of power behind the throne. What does he, he want for his clout. daughter? Sorry, someone said something I didn't hear. Yeah, I said he wants clout and he abuses Ophelia to, to, to try to prove uh, that Hamlet is mad for her love, as he puts it. Absolutely. The way that he uses um, Ophelia is absolutely shameful. He uses her as bait for a trap. You know how Hamlet tries to trap Claudius with the mousetrap play? In the scene before that, Bidot Khaled said a pawn, yes. Um, in the scene exactly before that, Polonius tries and with Claudius's help to use Ophelia as a trap, as a bait to grab Hamlet. Um, Shemat, go ahead. I see your hand raised. Go ahead and unmute yourself and talk, Shema. I can't hear you. So, okay. So somebody wrote, um, Shema wrote, Polonius wants Ophelia not to love Hamlet. Do we agree with this, actually? Do we think Polonius no. has a longer strategy? No, no. No, no, he doesn't even think about his daughter not to love Hamlet or, or about his daughter's love life. He, he just thinks about the information from Hamlet to be transferred and passed on to the king. He wants to use her to gain status with the king. Would he like it actually if she married Hamlet and became the queen one day? I Is mean, according, I don't according think so, to... That, that he... Hang on, Abdullah first. Go ahead. Okay. According to the version that we read, he would like it, of course. Uh, but according to, sh to the Shakespearean version, I think not because he said, um, didn't he say uh, when he was, when Laertes was talking to Ophelia before he goes off to France uh, and Polonius came in and then he, he started uh, telling her about Hamlet to stay away from him and not to, you know, elope with him, stuff like that. Absolutely. He doesn't want her to have an illicit relationship with him. Um, Khaled, what were you going to say? Yeah, I was going to say that he doesn't like uh, think about her. Like maybe this whole thing about not to go with the Hamlet about relationship and things. He doesn't want his of uh, one of his uh, like uh, generation, his daughter, like to get uh, involved with Hamlet because he sees that Hamlet is in revenge or is like uh, the enemy of the king, and he doesn't want his family to be like against the king because he wants status. And I don't think that so. he is in the level of thinking about his 
uh, daughter's future. Let me ask you two things. So one, I'm not going to ask you, I'll just tell you, when Gertrude, um, do you remember Gertrude the Queen, when she is setting up Ophelia for the trap? This is Act 3, Scene 1. She speaks. The Queen speaks to Ophelia and says, oh, where is it? I'm looking for it. She says, oh, I hope. For your part, Ophelia, I do wish that your good beauties be the happy cause of Hamlet's wildness. So shall I hope your virtues will bring him to his wanted way again. So within Shakespeare's play, it's realistic that Hamlet and Ophelia could get married. That's what the queen wants, for instance. The queen says, when Ophelia dies, she says, oh, I wish I could have thrown these flowers on your marriage bed yeah. instead of your grave. You should have been my Hamlet's wife. So it's realistic. I think Polonius wants it too. Um, because when he goes to the king and he says, oh, I know what's wrong with Hamlet. He's in love with my daughter. This is the disease. Danny, what do you think will be the medicine for this disease? Presumably, oh, they should be together. Let's get them married. Um, so this, what we're doing now is exploring the resources that Shakespeare has to offer an adapter. Um, because Shakespeare's play is very rich. It has many questions. Um, somebody typed in private chat, does Polonius know that the king killed his brother and that Hamlet is attempting revenge? Good question. Shakespeare doesn't tell you what Polonius knows. Shakespeare purposely leaves many questions. One of the beautiful things about Shakespeare is he takes something that his source material makes very clear and he makes it unclear. For instance, why does Hamlet pretend to be crazy? In the source, it's perfectly clear why. He does it to escape danger. But in Shakespeare, it's, it's not useful. His madness doesn't save him from anything. So why is he still mad? So Shakespeare kind of selectively erases some of the motives to make the characters more interesting. And he creates these gaps. What did they know? Why are they doing these things? And because of these gaps, it becomes interesting for rewriters and modern playwrights to jump in and complete these stories. Um, so we're talking about the father figures. We know what they want. Polonius wants, I think he wants a romantic comedy, basically. He wants to increase his own power and he wants to put some playful obstacles in the way of his daughter so that she can get together with Hamlet and they can have, you know, an exciting relationship and get married happily ever after, like a good romantic comedy. Maybe you read some romantic comedies. Or maybe you watched some films with this structure where the father creates difficulties for the young couple. I think that's what Polonius is doing. Claudius is a very weak father figure. He basically just wants order. He wants his authority in the throne not to be questioned, and he wants a good theater of being a good ruler. And he wants Hamlet to play his part in that theater. The ghost is writing his own play. He's writing a revenge tragedy, and he wants Hamlet to star in this revenge tragedy for him. Um, so Hamlet has many scripts to choose from, which script he will pick up and read. He doesn't want any of them. He says, I have that within which passes show. So this is my show. This is my play. I'm going to do random things. I won't make any sense, like, like an adolescent, you know, if any of you have uh, teenage children or siblings. You know, I'm going to do my own thing, even if it makes no sense. Um, meanwhile, around Hamlet are 
these other people, Fortinbras, who is behaving in a very clear, obvious way, following the warrior code. Laertes, who is behaving in a very clear, obvious way, following his code. Ophelia, who is miserable and confused. Um, so Hamlet has different models for his own behavior and different parental expectations for his behavior coming from his mother and his many, many, many fathers. Um, now I want to show you quickly what some adapters have done with this. Is this okay? Yeah. It's okay if we go to some slides? Yeah. Okay, so here we go. If I can do this. Um, one second. Is it the, the, the one you already sent me? This one? Yeah. The one I already sent you, yes. This one. Oh, I can't share my screen is why. You can share your screen, yeah. So do you have to change the slides for me then? Yeah, I can do that. That's kind of inconvenient. Um, am I, but I guess I'm not allowed to share mine or am I? Let me try. If you I unshare it for a minute. Okay, I think I, I need to first give you uh, uh, the ability to to um, control and share manage. Share my screen, because I am only a humble participant at this meeting. Okay, I'm not the host. On. Go on. Now you are in charge. I'm in charge. Yep. I can control your screen. What yeah. does that mean? It means you are my Shakespeare. But wait, how am I supposed to do this? Okay. I can control your screen, but I can't shift the slides. Or you can, can I? I can. Oh, but slowly. Yeah. Okay, interesting. All right. I'm still learning this technology, guys. So thank you for your patience. Um, I will not talk long about the first Arabic Hamlet. I only want to tell you one thing about it, which is, well, two things. It starred Sheikh Salama Hegezi, who was an old man already when he was playing Hamlet. And it had a happy ending. Um, here's the happy ending. I don't know if we can go to the slideshow um, function here. And you can see this is the end of the play. So Hamlet um, successfully kills Claudius and becomes the king and the ghost from the wings blesses him. Um, this is not a good interpretation of Shakespeare's play. It's a very bad interpretation. It misses a lot of the point, but it turns out, is that you or me, Rafa? The problem is that- <laughs> Yeah, no, uh, Nor says it doesn't sound like a Shakespearean ending. No, it's not a Shakespearean uh, ending. You know whose ending it is, is that fat guy on the left. He's French. He's Alexandre Dumas. Um, it was his idea that this play had to be a good classical play, and so it could not have this mixed up, disorderly ending. And when the Arabic version was produced, Mr. Tanyus Abdo, this guy down here, um, translated it from French, which he knew much better than English. And so he wasn't translating Shakespeare's play at all. Mm -hmm. And so, it's not that he was a naive Arab writer with a naive Arab audience, and that's why he produced this un-Shakespearean ending. Um, it's because the ending is neat and orderly and classical, like a French 19th century play, because that's what it is. Um, so this is about sources, that an adaptation of, oi, an adaptation of Shakespeare is not always an adaptation of Shakespeare. Um, and the reason we don't know this, this is the Dumas play where it was published. Yes, it has to be happy. Um, so an adaptation of, it, it doesn't have to be happy, nor what it has to be is justice has to be served. So a beautiful, it's, it's unfair for a good character to meet a bad end. That would not be just. And so at the end, the ghost judges everybody. And Hamlet says, and what is my punishment? 
And the ghost says, you will live. That's your punishment or reward. And of course, various people get very upset. You can see down at the bottom of the slide this comment by um, Dr. Amal Amin Zeki in her PhD. She's an Iraqi scholar who was outraged by Tanya's Abdu's horrible translation. And she said, oh, this is the translator playing on the emotions of a culturally and aesthetically unsophisticated audience that was incapable of distinguishing between good and bad art. Um, you have, um, Dr. Rifat has these slides so he can share them with you later. I'm sorry if the writing is too small to read, but you can do this um, later. The point is just, my point is just that the source matters, that where something is adapted from is going to determine how it's adapted, what the text even is. And some of the stupidest things that Dr. Zeki found in this 1901 Arabic text actually are, we can blame them on the French. We can't blame them on the unsophisticated Arab audience at all. That's the first thing. Um, so it's a translation of a different text. Um, and yeah, you can't blame the audience for liking it, but also so this is why this is hard to know, is because you can see, can you see where it says, um, Hamlet, Ta'alif Shakespeare, Sha'ir al Inglesia Shahir. It doesn't say Ta'alif Alexandre Dumas, Al Katib Franci Shabi, you know, none of that. So this is why we don't know about indirect reception, is because writers lie. They, they will tell you, I read Shakespeare. They won't tell you, oh, I read Cliff Notes summary of Shakespeare. Um, they won't tell you, oh, I read a joke about Shakespeare on my cousin's blog. You know, they, they'll tell you always that they engage directly with the original. <laughs> and they'll exaggerate their knowledge of this original, even if they don't know a word of English, it's okay. So, okay, moving forward. Um, trying to move forward. Hello. How do we do this? It even says Riwayat Hamlet, which, which is not, I mean, it's a play, it's not even a novel. Yeah, you know, that's what they used to call it. it Riwayat meant Temthilia, sometimes they would add, but sometimes just Riwayat. Sorry, I don't know what's happening with this. Rafat, is this you but, controlling the screen or me? The problem is that every time a participant uh, uh, wants to join, I have to admit him or her. So I don't know if you, can you do that? The participant. I can't. I can't admit participants. Um, it's okay. Go on. Anyway, you get the idea. Okay. I can't move forward. Can you move forward? I think you can. I can? Yeah. There is just some delay because I'm controlling your screen. This is amazing, by the way, guys, that I can even yeah. talk to you in Gaza at all and I'm sitting in Boston, let alone control your screens. This, this is complete magic. Um, Akram writes, it's essential for the translator of Shakespeare to have a good literary competence. Sahih. But um, Alexandre Dumas had a perfectly good literary competence for his audience. And every translator and adapter is serving a particular need as well as a particular audience. Just like Tanya Sapu was serving his audience, which wanted to hear Sheikh Salama Hegezi sing. So the monologues in that play sound like opera arias oh. um, because they're designed for performance. That's a legitimate goal for a translation. It's not a literary translation, it's something else, but it's legitimate. Um, okay, I'm trying to move forward, but I can't. Okay, can do it. I'm viewing your screen. I'm not moving it. Can you move forward? Okay, um, and move forward one more. So now we're going 
we're jumping forward 65 years um, into the Cold War. The Soviet Union is important. Soviet culture is being exported to the Arab world in huge amounts. And in 1964, some people who suffered under Stalin make a film in which Hamlet is not weak. He is not hesitant. He's not insane. He's just a repressed dissident who wants to express himself and wants to find a way to live decently in the face of political oppression, and he can't. This film is very interesting to Arab audiences. It has a big effect. Um, I think we can move forward now. Some more. Um, it resonates with people who grew up under Gamal Abdel Nasser, who, or who experienced the leadership or whatever you want to call it, of Gamal Abdel Nasser, um, who was a very theatrical leader. Here he is with a group of actors, actually. You can see how comfortable he is with the stage and with the microphone um, and with the audience, especially, always performing for an audience. Um, and so for these people, these intellectuals, Ayyam Abdel Nasser, to see theater as politics and politics as theater is very natural. And this colors how they adapt Hamlet. And I think this gets into the play that you read for today that I want to talk with you about, um, which is Mamdoha Adoens. Um, keep going. Yep, forward, 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 forward. Um, even more forward. We can get all the way to um, stop. OK. So here is Mamdou Hadouin's play. Uh, this, actually, can you go back one more? And even one more. Okay, stop. So these are plays. Um, I studied several of them. There are more than six of them, actually. Um, plays written after Nasser's death that all kind of responded to the heroic Soviet Hamlet and the heroism of Nasser in the same way by treating Gamal Abdel Nasser as the ghost, the ghost of Hamlet's father. He's dead. You don't know exactly what he wants from you, but you know you're a bad person for not being able to do it. Um, you have to be faithful to his legacy but that would put you in real danger because Claudius or Sadat is now in charge. Interestingly, this, did, this wasn't just in Egypt. This was everywhere. The shadow of Abdel Nasser fell over Iraq and Syria and Palestine and Jordan. And as an idea, the idea of Arab nationalism, al-Ghuruba, was so strong um, that after Nasser's death, there was a feeling that people naturally put onto Hamlet, the, the way that a lot of intellectuals found to talk about their confusion and their dissatisfaction with themselves was to talk about Hamlet. Um, so we're going to go into the play that you read for today. It was written in 1976. Shockingly, it was published it wasn't censored. Um, and you can see how this play works. So, okay, let's come out of the slides. Let me see people again. Um, I see there are now 50 people on this call. Yeah. Voila, so, um, you have your hand up. Do you want to say something? Um, no, thanks. Okay, I just said. So, tell me what you guys thought of Mamdo Halwan's play. Khaled, Fadan. Yes, uh, I, I read the, the, the very beginning of it, and when uh, the, the situation where Hamlet dies, that was very similar to the end of the original Hamlet. And then all of a sudden, it takes a shift where Hamlet 
starts uh, again. And I don't know where this is going. I, I felt lost at the beginning of the play. Can you just explain what happened? Did you read the rest of the play? Not, not all of it. Uh, not yet, sadly, okay. Not yet. So this play, this play is a retelling of Shakespeare's Hamlet as a kind of flashback after this opening scene where Horatio says, oh, they killed Hamlet. Um, somebody, have any of you read the whole play? If you read it and you're ready to offer a synopsis, um, go ahead and unmute yourself. They were, they are under a lot of pressure with assignments and homework and... Uh, Too much studio. homework, okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's fine, <laughs> I will summarize. Hamlet but is an alcoholic. He is an intellectual, he is a theater director, he drinks too much, he is politically a little bit out of it. The play is called Hamlet is Taikov Mutakhiran because he's always the last one to know everything. So what he doesn't know is that Claudius is making a peace deal with Fortinbras. Instead of taking back the land conquered by Fortinbras, is this ringing any bells? This is sounding familiar at all. Um, instead of taking back the land occupied by Fortinbras, Claudius is making a deal, Sofka. He is inviting Fortinbras to visit. He is signing a peace treaty and a free trade agreement with him. Hamlet finds this out late. His idea is to write a play about it to put on like a mousetrap, right? Because this is what Hamlet does, basically. Even Shakespeare's Hamlet, what does he do? He directs theater. So he wants to make a theater production to embarrass the king. This does not work. The king has spies. Polonius is the head of the Mohabarat. Uh, Rosencrantz is working for him. Uh, Ahmed contributes in the chat that Polonius seems smarter, absolutely, and more dangerous, and that nobody but Hamlet sees the ghost. And that Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, their roles start small, but they grow and grow and grow and grow. And by the end of the play, Rosencrantz is kind of running the show as the head of the intelligence agency after Polonius. So this is a very dark reading of Hamlet. Um, so this is important. Nobody but Hamlet sees the ghost. Hamlet sees the ghost and he is, um, he doesn't know what to do with this ghost. Um, he goes to the grave. He even opens his father's grave. He wants to know why this ghost is following him around, why he is um, haunting him so much. He's not haunting anyone else. Everyone else is ready to forget the ghost and move on. Um, and everyone makes fun of him when he says that he got up and walked out of his grave. So let me find this quote for you. So Hamlet tells Horatio, he says, it's not imagination. I saw the ghost. I saw my father. I went to the grave and I saw him. I opened the coffin. Oh God, Horatio, a disgusting thing. Is this what happens to dead people? Imagine my father has become... So he opens the grave and he sees decay rot. He sees that it's impossible to be faithful to the vision of this father. He's gone. But the reality around him, bones and worms, exactly, Abdullah, yes. Um, and, and yet, 
that doesn't mean you can forget about the dead person and move on because reality is so corrupt. It's capitalist. It's treacherous because the father is making friends with the, or not the father, the new king, Claudius, is making friends with the enemies of the nation. Um, what do you guys think? What is this play about? From what I've told you so far, or those of you, Amna and Abdullah and Khaled, who have read it, and others who have read it, what is this play actually about? And on mule side. Excuse me? Okay, Amna, say more. It's about the tyranny of the Arab leaders. How so? How do you know this is a play about Arab leaders? How do you know it's about Camp David? Yeah, Noor hasn't even read the play, but it already reminds him of the peace treaty. Abdullah felt it was about Palestine. So I want to draw your attention to some things about this play. First of all, it doesn't say anywhere, I am about Palestine. No Arab names, no Arab costumes, no Islam, no nothing. Nobody is praying. And if they do, it's Christian prayers that could be anywhere in Europe. It's not marked as right. Arab at all. Um, unlike other plays, you'll see like um, Suleiman al Bassam has this Mu'tamar um, al Hamlet where they're all, you know, wearing their Khaliji stuff, costumes. Um, none of this. But yes, this play is about Palestine. It's not because you're connecting the dots, it's because it's impossible for any Arab audience to read this play without understanding that Fortinbras is Israel. And that the play. It doesn't condemn Fortinbras, actually. Fortinbras is like the weather. You know, what do you expect? He does what he does. He comes and he says, oh, unless, um, unless Hamlet is out of the way, my capitalists won't invest their millions, he says. Um, Ashab ru'us al so Fortinbras is Fortinbras, but the people being condemned are Claudius and Hamlet, the people at home, the corrupt, brutal tyrants, and the incompetent intellectuals who are making lots of noise, putting on theater, knocking over tables, getting drunk, um, and accomplishing absolutely nothing to create any real resistance. Um, and when you read the play, I hope you will argue with each other about whether Hamlet could have done anything different in this play, whether it's his fault that he is so ineffective. Um, so you can see what Odwen is doing. This is a play using Shakespeare and making very good use of the resources available in Shakespeare, making good use of the history of Arab Shakespeare, where Hamlet is a political hero, and turning that upside down to fit the Arab situation. It's written in 1976, so before Camp David. He already knows what's going to happen. He already sees Sadat making some overtures to the Israeli government. He sees where it's going. He writes this play. In Syria, it's allowed to be produced because it's taken as a criticism of Egypt not as a criticism of Arab leaders through the whole region, which I think you're right, is what it is really. Um, it's not marked in any way as an Arab play, but you can see how it uses the Shakespeare resources and the Arab realities.
um, to produce something that all of you can recognize. Um, even you who were born long after 1976 when it was produced. Um, I'm ready to stop here and take questions if you have questions. And yes, Malak, you are absolutely right. The very name of the play blames Hamlet. Yes, Hamlet wakes up late. Hamlet oversleeps, implying that Hamlet could have made a difference if he had woken up sooner, if he had been less naive and less trusting and less confident that his intellectualism and his theater would somehow be enough. Um, so yeah, there's a critique of the Arab intellectual as well. Um, do you have questions for me? Can I ask something? I, I don't know. I, I told them you will all fail if you don't ask questions, but they're not asking questions. I don't know. They uh, will, they will, they will. They'll take <laughs> questions in the chat because they're too shy to speak. Sorry. That's fine. But because go ahead. I have, a, I have a list of questions. The, I, I, I like your translation because uh, when I looked at the Arabic text and uh, uh, the author uses the name uh, Golden Stern, I was like, who is this? And then I, I don't know where he got this Rosenstern. I, I think it's because we have, but I want to ask a question if like, I like your honesty to the text. Like you didn't say, for example, this is, uh, maybe he made a mistake. He, because I, I, I hear people all the time say, uh, sometimes uh, Gertrude, for example, or Barbantio or Barbantio. Sometimes even we're not sure about how the name is, is pronounced, but. Uh, Didi Mona, yeah. You didn't assume that this could be a, wrong, a mistake he, he committed and you just, you fix it. Uh, but when you, when you thought of uh, sticking to Goldenstern, did you want to bring this Jewish element to, to the play, to the text, to keep it? Like sometimes we talk about uh, the, the Stein or the Stein in, in, in the name. Was this intentional from you as a translator? Yeah, I think it was interesting to me that he called Gildenstern by this other name, Huldenstern. So when I was translating Aldoan's play, I was translating it, of course, for an American audience. But because of what I told you before about indirect reception, I wanted to leave in the variation because possibly he was not reading an English text. Possibly he was adapting from an Arabic text of Hamlet that I haven't seen yet. This is a trace of something. And yeah, the, it sounds, you know, German names in English sound Jewish. So it does sound Jewish, Holdenstern, even though it isn't historically. It could be German or Dutch. Uh, but yeah, I thought it was interesting and it was the only trace of anything Jewish or Zionist on the surface of the text. Otherwise, he very carefully kept it completely neutral and delocalized. Okay, more questions, guys, ladies? Hello, thank you for this informative lecture. I know it's a little bit noisy here. In fact, uh, you know, uh, I know that translation is an act of interpretation. Uh, last week I was teaching uh, reader response, and we were talking about like uh, three modes of interpretation. But the last one were really, uh, you know, uh, see how uh, the text is relevant to our time or, you know. Now my question is like, what text are we translating, you know? Uh, like, are we translating the original text or the text which is like a, a new production of, let's say, uh, a reader uh, living in a period of time? So I know that all these, you know, translations, but uh, don't we have, like, when we translate, uh, you know, uh, should we, like, be faithful to the original text or not? See? Uh, this is my question because you know I think you know reading like other interpretation or like if somebody is rewriting 
Hamlet, it's a different play. Is it? Thank you. I mean, it depends what you're doing. If you're offering readers, I think it's all about your audience and your purpose, right? So if you are saying, this is Shakespeare's Hamlet for you to study in class, then you need a translation that is careful with footnotes, with explanations, and this is this wordplay that I couldn't capture, but here's what it meant. And this is this um, significance of violets in Shakespeare's time, and that's why Ophelia is talking about violets and all of that. Um, if you're trying to produce a contemporary play that says something about the contemporary situation, you have much less faithfulness issues and much more kind of to accent the things that deal with your environment. So after I, after I translated Mamdo Hadwan's play, in 2016 it was published, and in 2017, to my amazement, it was produced in English at a university in the United States by a young director and professor named Rebecca Magor. And so, for instance, when I had, um, I used the phrase, our war martyrs, shahadeh, which was in Audouin's text. I translated it as martyrs faithfully because I wanted my readers to see what that text was. Um, and then when um, she was producing it in the United States, she changed that text from martyrs to our men and women in uniform who sacrificed themselves. You know, she introduced the American cliche. It was perfect. So that readers who are used to this, um, nonsense who are used to this kind of political rhetoric and cliche uh, would immediately recognize it and would be able to connect what Adwen wrote not only to Syria but also to their own government. Um, so I thought this was a good example of a retranslation that served a purpose. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. I see many hands. Uh, uh, this is this is. Let's start with Noor. She raised her hand uh, first. Go ahead. This, this is the Noor of 2012, whose answer you quoted on your blog. So I was, you know, Noor, you have to be here. And she was like thrilled. So yeah. Was, uh, to make you know. <laughs> And back then I was like, you doubted me? You thought I plagiarized my answer? Because back then he sent me asking me like, you plagiarized your answer from the internet? I was like, no, oh. she took my answer. No, I quoted you. <laughs> I'm oh, yeah. sorry. I didn't mean to get you in trouble. But this brings really good memories because it's been like a long time. Okay, so I'm not going to take a lot of your time and I'm just going to ask my question. Go ahead. Um, now, I don't know if this is relevant or not, but somehow it was brought up. My question, can we judge an adaptation by its faithfulness to the original or should an, an adaptation be read separately from the original? Like in literature, sometimes we say the author is dead, so we read the text. So can we kill the original and just read the adaptation and see the adaptation for its own potential? Yes and no. Um, this is a really good question. Shakespeare kills his originals, right? Shakespeare is a relentless adapter, not to say thief, speaking of plagiarism, of other people's stories, other people's plots and characters. He never acknowledges his sources. He always, you're not supposed to go and compare him with Plutarch. This is something, you know, scholars do. They say, oh, Plutarch wrote this, but Shakespeare said this. Or, oh, we think Shakespeare took this passage in uh, The Tempest from this essay by Montaigne and blah, blah, blah. You know, because we need to make careers. We do this because Shakespeare is great. And so we study his sources as sources and as if he makes something out of them. 
people who adapt Shakespeare don't do this. They don't steal. They, it's just the opposite. They want to highlight that they're using Shakespeare. They want to say, see how cleverly I'm using Shakespeare. They want you to do this comparison of their text and Shakespeare's text. And that comparison gives their play power. So for instance, if you read Adwan's play, this Hamlet, Yastaykot Mutakhran, and you read it only by itself without knowing Shakespeare's Hamlet or knowing that it existed, it would be pretty boring. It wouldn't have this extra power, this kick of, look, Shakespeare already saw this problem that we're having in our politics. Look, this is just like Shakespeare's Hamlet. So I think when an adaptation, does that make sense, Noor? It makes sense. So it's like to appreciate the adaptation, you should know the original. Yeah, if it stages itself as an adaptation, if it says, oh, you all know this story. This is the story of Hamlet. I'm just going to put in a couple of different twists. Um, then it makes sense to do that comparison and to see how close it is and how far it is. Like, um, yeah, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt, but I don't know. I'm sure you know 1984 for Orwell. Mm -hmm. There was a movie, Equilibrium. Have you seen the movie and watched the book? Uh, sorry, have you like- I read the book, but I haven't watched the movie. So the movie is so much relevant. You, 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 if you read the book, you see the relevance, but it lives on its own. Like there are so many like differences, but it feels so much based on the book. And yet somehow the, the movie and the book are so the same, so, so much different. So that's why I was thinking like, the whole dilemma of books and, and movies. And then like, a, a movie is an adaptation of, of a book. And sometimes we complain, like the, the, the movie doesn't do justice to the book. And sometimes you're like, the movie is perfect, but you know, it's not the book. So I think this is why I was wondering if, you know, if, if, if an adaptation of a play w where both of them are performed, mm -hmm. th is that problem? or does that problem exist, you know? Yeah, no, I think it depends completely on the relationship of the second text to the first text or the second work, the second film, whatever. Does it, is it trying to hide the first text to just treat it as a source or is it trying to play with the distance between itself and the other text? Um, and I think you can, so for instance, if, if the source is not mentioned in the title, maybe you're supposed to read the adaptation on its own. But if the titles are the same, you're supposed to read it as a comparison. Uh, Rahaf? Hi. Hi. Okay, so my question is actually regarding um, Hamlet's character. And I just wanted to know your opinion on this matter. Can we actually say that Hamlet is guiltless or innocent? Like, he, he kills Polonius, and I know he does that by accident, but at the same time, he doesn't express any kind of regret, or he doesn't express guilt. And at the same time, we find him thinking about whether he should kill his uncle or not, and, and all of that, and it's kind of like inconsistent, you know? So do you actually think he's innocent? First, I want to say something about the history of Hamlet. There is a reason that we can't make sense of this character and he seems to us incoherent or self-contradictory or uneven. Sometimes he is very vengeful and at other times he's very thoughtful. Um, there is a reason for that historically, which is that there are two versions of the play, both written by Shakespeare. It yeah. seems now there's the so-called bad quarto, where it's much more of a performance text. It's shorter and Hamlet is more decisive and everything is more religious, more Christian. 
So there's a real idea of God and hell and sin and all of this. And then the text we mostly have is the so-called second quarto. These are just different versions of the play, but it seems that Shakespeare maybe wrote one for performance and then rewrote it for publication as a book. And so that Hamlet has these long speeches and he's very philosophical. And then when editors came, they didn't want to drop any piece of writing by Shakespeare on the floor. And so they picked it all up off the floor. They stuck it together into this kind of monster. And they said, this, this is Shakespeare's Hamlet. Um, and so there are some contradictions. I'm exaggerating, so you understand. But that's one reason why Hamlet is so hard to understand morally, why he's all over the place. Um, Can I, say I agree something? with you. I don't know if he's, I don't think he's very innocent. I think the way that he treats Ophelia is yeah, very to hard to explain. Mm. Yeah. I think one of, uh, many of my students uh, believe that he, uh, that Hamlet killed Polonius intentionally. Uh, yes. Hamlet was threatening to his mother in a way, in a sense, and mm. somebody was hiding behind uh, the curtain and he shouted, oh, help, help, help. And, and he I recognizes was, the voice. I, I think it would be, it would be, uh, yeah, we suspend our disbelief sometimes. I think it could be possible for him to recognize that this is uh, a stupid Polonius' uh, voice coming from. And then he, Parat did for a docker. He's so, know. yeah, I agree with you. I don't know what he knows at that moment. He's so excited. He's so <gasps> about his whole conversation with his mother and there's so much tension in this confrontation for him. And then he takes out this tension and, you know, killing this character behind the curtain. Maybe he knows who it is. He's not He's, innocent at I all. It, it, if Hamlet is adapted into a comedy, I think it, many things would make sense. Like I would, you know how kids, when they uh, play hide and seek, where they just hide their eyes, if this is a comedy, Polonius would be hiding half his, you know, like his worn out shoes would be sticking out, uh, something, you know. And then that would be very, like, hilarious uh, in a sense. But again, this is Shakespeare, like you said something amazing at the beginning, how there are so many gaps for us to think, to provoke us into thinking, into trying to find our own answers, into disputing. He's... I, I think it's important to realize that about Hamlet too, just for ourselves as people and as readers, it's important to understand just because he's in a horrible situation and he's surrounded by injustice and he's being betrayed and spied on, on every side and reported about and misjudged and everything. It doesn't mean he's a good person uh -huh. just because he's in a bad situation. Um, it doesn't mean that he's, a good man. Um, and yeah, Noor points out in the chat that he's also having some trauma because he just lost his father recently. And he's responsible for so many deaths before the play is over. I mean, he sent uh, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern to their deaths very coldly. Well, as he points that, out, that that's... Uh, that, was, that was not... A, that's their own that, fault. As he says. I mean, Let's see, Maram. Uh, Abdullah, excuse me. Maram is raising her hand. Go ahead. Her Go ahead. Mm, hello, everyone. Hello. Um, actually, I have two questions. Uh, first one is about uh, Hamlet wakes up late. Why, uh, why do you think the character of, of Polonius is different from the one that is in Shakespeare's Hamlet? And the other question is about, do you, do you believe that Ophelia is really committed suicide or not? Okay, thank you. Um, I'll talk about Adwan first. His Polonius builds on things, it builds on resources that Shakespeare makes available. Do you remember how Shakespeare has Polonius behave when his son goes to study abroad in France? 
Do you remember what he does? He sends a spy. He sends his servant and says, go find out, you know, who the Danish guys are in Paris and find out what my son is up to and don't let him know you're spying on him. So Polonius has this spy master kind of thing. For us, it's funny, but it's very easy to turn it sinister into a real kind of mahabharat behavior. Um, and in an Arab context, of course, that's how you would see that kind of behavior. Look, he's spying on Hamlet. He's spying on Ophelia. He's spying on his own son, Laertes. Um, and so then it's easy for Adwen to turn him into someone who really wants power, who's not, not funny, not a comic character anymore. Wow. even though the young people in the play try to laugh at him. Uh, also, it's interesting that he's corrupt. He is taking, he's stealing from the government oh. supplies in Alduin. Um, I think it's actually very clever. I think it's a very good use of Polonius. I think, I think yeah, the way he, he speaks uh, too little in comparison with the worldliness uh, uh, he, you know, how worldly he is in, in Shakespeare. I like also how the fact that we, we had the sense that in, in Shakespeare that Laertes was a womanizer. He was in, in France chasing women. But here, he's like, you know, he's going to study, you know, get your diploma. So yeah, yeah. Because Arab, this is again the Arab patriarchy. They send their kids, the people in, in authority, they send their kids, you know, wherever they are, paying them the money of the, 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 the state, and then we know yeah. that. Uh, so yeah, yeah. like, we'll like get a scholarship and study yeah. our Arabic folklore or whatever over there. Yeah, so we have Khalid, Saeed, and then Ahmed is also uh, 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 planning to ask questions. Go on, Khalid. Yes, uh, I, would, I would like, like to add something before asking my question. Uh, about uh, Hamlet killing Polonius and the reason that it was intentional, in my opinion, it is intentional because he just saw the king before coming in the chamber of his mother. So uh, regarding my question, I know that this is like uh, a drama and it was written for the sake of being like uh, acted on the, on the stage, but I would think of this Audouin like work of more a parody because it's like, when I read the part I read, like I couldn't stop laughing about the way and uh, he wrote this play. And, and uh, I also compared the character of Horatio, how it was in Shakespeare and how it was in Odwan and how, how Horatio became like so uh, audacious to talk and not to agree with everything with Hamlet and to ask him, and even he, he has the chance to sort of like wise. So I don't think, uh, why, like, we don't consider this as a parody? I know it's like uh, an adaptation, it's like for, for acting, but can you, like, uh, tell me what you... I can, yeah. Um, different people use the word parody differently, and I have discovered that many people from different uh, parts of the world and different literary traditions like in East Asia, for instance, parody doesn't mean something funny. Um, but for me, a parody is something that would make us laugh at Shakespeare. And I think this play doesn't make us laugh at Shakespeare. I think it makes Shakespeare laugh with us at our political situation. Um, that's why I wouldn't, because the way that I use the word parody is something that exposes what's ridiculous about Shakespeare's play. Mm. Uh, like what Dr. Rifat said about, um, if you could see Polonius's old shoes sticking out under the curtain and Hamlet was stabbing him, this would be a parody, right? Because it would make you laugh at the plot holes and the ridiculous points in Shakespeare. But this is something different. I think this is using Shakespeare as a rhetorical tool or weapon. Um, to laugh at other things. Uh, we have uh, Ahmed. Ahmed wanted to ask a question. Ahmed Sheikh Khalil, go on uh, briefly. Yeah. Hi, Ms. Margaret. Thank you for this uh, very uh, informative lecture. I think, uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Rifat, but I think this is uh, the best Shakespeare lecture I've ever taken uh, so far. Uh, 
Well, I, I read the, uh, the, the play uh, once, then I read your introduction, and you said that there is the first reading, a second reading, a third reading, and then the fourth reading. And I agree, because it's multi -layered. But I have uh, some questions, and I, I like the, the comment about censorship, because, yeah, it's, it's a strange, because it's full of uh, symbols that uh, really shake the, uh, the, uh, the authority, and especially in Egypt. Uh, in the time of the Sadat. But I think they are too dumb to, to censor it, to understand the symbols. What, because it needs to, um, uh, you have to know Shakespeare, you have to know Hamlet, and then you have to connect. Uh, so maybe they, um, I don't know, maybe they did not, uh, because it's very strange, they are not that democratic to allow something like this. Uh, well, um, I have, um, there's something very strange about this play because it starts with the last scene of the original Hamlet where um, Laertes and Hamlet uh, are fighting. And then the whole play goes to a different uh, way uh, in a very, I don't know, 20th century um, circumstances. But there is yes. something I didn't understand that this, uh, first scene is not exactly like the last scene of the original Hamlet because there's Rosencrantz there uh, while he was dead in the original Hamlet and um, no, nobody dies but Hamlet and Laertes and this I, I know this is very realistic because it reminds us of our reality of the 11, 2011 um, uh, revolution in Egypt it at the end of the day, uh, the revolutionary guys in prison or dead, and uh, still the uh, the dictators and uh, they are in, in charge. Maybe different names, but they are there. But in in the original Hamlet, I always I don't see it always a a sad ending. It is sad. It is tragic. But still, the all the devils die. The king, the queen, everybody dies. Even Hamlet die dies. Uh, but in this or a version of Hamlet, nobody dies but Hamlet and Laertes, the young generation, the revolutionary generation. And yeah. even the first scene, which is uh, a copy paste of the original Hamlet is not a copy paste. It's different. It is uh, more, I don't know, more sad, more tragic. This is one thing. Another thing is that in this version of, ha of Hamlet, which is, which I like again, uh, everybody's different. Fortin Brass is different. Hamlet is different. Horatio is different. Everybody is different. Maybe Horatio not that different. Horatio is still the same. But everybody is different. And Ophelia is different. Ophelia here, I, it's not the first time I hear somebody uh, or I read uh, this understanding of Ophelia that she didn't, did not love Hamlet. She just wanted to be the queen. This is why I don't read this in the original Hamlet, but I know that some readers read this in her character. But this Ophelia that is that understands she's more strong, more independent. Maybe yes, her father and her brother try all the time to to say stuff and to direct her. But she's more independent, more strong, but more evil, evilish. I don't know. Is it an anti-feminist reading of Ophelia or a feminist? Reading? I don't know. Feminist reading. You know, of I don't. Strong. She is stronger in a certain sense. She's stronger using stereotypically feminine tools, tools of seduction. Oh. Um, but I think that's not the point. I think the point is that there is, the situation, the politics are so corrupt that it turns everyone into the worst version of themselves. Everything is corrupted. Patriotism is corrupted. Sex is corrupted. Love is corrupted. Um, because that's the mood in the kingdom. Um, so I think that that is where that Ophelia comes from. I don't think it's a statement about women in any way, um, any more than Shakespeare's Hamlet is. I think it's just a reflection of the times that, uh, Adwan is trying to set up exactly as you say, all the good people, um, there are a few good people and they die very efficiently, uh, leaving everything intact, the same deal, the same tyrants, the same repression. Yeah, uh, thank can, you very much. Uh, uh, 
Ahmed, the Ahmed made uh, also ex excellent point. Also, Gertrude is absent, so the woman is not there in the ending. She's there. She she's not very important. Yeah. Yeah, she's but there. She, she's like, oh, Fortinbras, I love your jacket, you know. <laughs> I think the, 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 the fact that Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are back is that this is probably this, because this is, again, like you said, th these are the Mukhabarat uh, guys, and the Mukhabarat never dies. So if they die, you have typically uh, uh, two other typical guys who would do the same. Just replace them. They're interchangeable, right? Mm? Yeah. Uh, same newspaper, same holes, and they're just going to be, that's uh, fine. Uh, uh, how much time do we have? Five, ten minutes, maybe? Well, it's your class. You tell me. Uh, I'm good for about 15 more minutes, if you five. need me. Uh, Saeed, Abdurrahman, uh, and Zaid. Uh, also, I want one or two of the ladies to ask questions, but could you please uh, be brief? No, the ladies are very nicely asking questions in the private chat, very quietly. Uh, Saeed, go on. Thanks, Ms. Litivim, for being with us. And we would like first thank our doctor for, for giving us the opportunity to speak out for the first time with foreigners. Uh, my question is a little bit critical. I have a never-ending uh, critical question about Shakespeare, whether he is anti-feminist or not. As you know, uh, he, as, as you're interested in Shakespeare and as a woman, so you have to be impartial. My question is, some, uh, my point is some critics believe he is feminist and some say no. Those who say that, that he is uh, anti-feminist uh, say that he just uh, reflects the society traditions and uh, how society treats just women uh, without, uh, and you have to pay uh, much attention that uh, the, all of his uh, plays without any signs of, ref of regret, regrets uh, with women when she is killed, you know? Does that inter intercede for him to be any anti-feminist, just to reflect the society, ha habits or traditions? I don't think he's anti-feminist at all. I think his female characters are deep and interesting. I just pasted into the chat, sort almost as a joke, um, an article that someone wrote last year actually suggesting that Shakespeare's works were really written by a woman because he's so feminist because his women are yeah you know they, often they disguise themselves as men and when they do mm. nobody can tell that they're women because they're not stupid and they're not foolish and they're not trivial you know they're, they're completely on par with the men sometimes smarter. Um, I think Ophelia is in a very difficult situation in this play and it's hard to judge her, but her speech um, about, oh, what a noble mind is here overthrown when Hamlet uh, breaks up with her very violently and cruelly, I think it's a very good speech and she's completely on top of the situation. She understands what is happening. Uh, so yeah, I think if anything, it's men that Shakespeare is very critical of. His men are often violent, sometimes foolish. They lie, they cheat. Yeah, Ophelia is too, is is smart. Uh, there is one instance. Um, sorry, I just jumped in because I got excited. Uh, where Hamlet uh, tells her. Um, uh, when he's preparing to play the mousetrap, to put on the mousetrap, and he tells her, uh, can I lay in your lap or something like that? And she understands the, the curse word that he says slyly. And uh, she tells him, hey, you mean nothing. And the word nothing was used in another meaning, another connotation back then. So she understands. Of course she understands, but she, what's she supposed to do? Her radius of movement is very narrow. Doctor, we can't hear you. You're muted. Oh, I'm not speaking. Abud, go on. Abud, Tayyip Zaid, go on. Hello. Yeah, hello. What's up? Uh, there is a, a statement tells the criminals aren't uh, born but made by circumstances around them. 
Uh, how do we can connect this uh, with the Hamlet case uh, as he killed Bolognas and didn't regret? Thank you. Oh, uh, was Hamlet made a criminal? Um, this is a complicated question. I don't know. Um, it's because there's a reason I don't know. Um, the, the reason I don't know the answer to your question is because Shakespeare doesn't let us see Hamlet before everything goes wrong. We never see Hamlet when he's happy with Ophelia. We never see him when he's happy studying in Germany, getting his degree in Wittenberg, studying philosophy. You know, we never, we never get to see him before everything in his life goes topsy-turvy. Um, so we don't actually know what the man was like. We have to take Ophelia's word for it when she says, oh, he was so handsome, he was so smart, everyone respected him. Abdurrahman, go ahead. Uh, okay. Um... I don't know what, 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 why am I, ask, uh, am I asking this question, uh, just out of curiosity. Uh, but I want to know, uh, what were your motivations to translate Erdogan's version of Hamlet? What motivates you, what provokes you to translate it? Oh, I thought it was a very good play. I liked the word play in it. I thought it was clever and smart. I thought I had published a book called Hamlet's Arab Journey. Um, this book exists now also in Arabic, Rahlat Hamlet al-Arabiya. Um, and publishing this book, I thought, okay, I'm making many arguments about Arab culture and the Arab world for my basically American and English readers. And maybe I should let them see some things for themselves. So they don't have to take my interpretation. They don't have to take my word for it. So these were my motivations that I enjoyed the play and I, it was fun to spend. Oh, thank you. That's nice. That's not the book though. Oh, um, it's, uh, this is more recent and this is just a collection of articles somewhere up there. I think the first slide is the picture of my book. Um, so it's, uh, so anyway, I just wanted to make my sources uh, available to my audience um, so that they could read this for themselves. And can so you, they could see. Can you tell us about the, the cover? Because everybody was fascinated by it. Because it's more Palestinian, because this is the typical Palestinian uh, kofia, this white thing. My grandfather, my both grandfathers had uh, 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 kofias like, like this one. So, and you, if you, once you see it, you can't unsee it. It's true. Yeah, and, this uh, is the Sheikh Zubair, as someone just said in the chat. Yeah. Exactly, um, as Rahaf said. Yeah, it's, um, and you guys have so many good questions in the chat. I apologize that I don't have time to get to all of them, such as Hamlet is in the wrong play. What would be the right play for him? Uh, no, I didn't make that cover. It, this is not my book. This is a book of essays that I co-edited with Catherine Hennessy, and her husband made this cover, the Shakespeare, or the Arab Shakespeare. Um, just, you know, to be funny, um, to be... There... There was... What'd you say? I think that uh, like there's a part in the cover on the left corner, uh, the very left corner, the the guy with like a uh, a black face, like the face is not showing, and then you have him dressing as I don't know. I see like a a military dress. I don't know if it's like a. It, it looks like. Oh a yeah. Cop. So this so shows that... like. Yeah, hukm al askar that we have like in some Arab countries. Mm hmm. So that's actually from a play, that is from a production. Um, so is yeah, the one on the right. Yeah, um, but like, it's when you it's put it from in the a context. Shakespeare production by, mm -hmm. um, I think this is a Moroccan play by Nabil Lahlou. 
Um, and that's one of the costumes. So yeah, they had him in local costume. I don't know, how do you feel looking at uh, Shakespeare wearing this, uh, wearing the kofia? I, with the I told Dr. Rifat, he looks like my grandpa. <laughs> like same mustache, same everything. And he claimed that he looks like his grandpa, which, mean, which would mean that we have the same grandpa. No, no. Are you related? Ahmed Abul Jidian. Ahmed, could you please uh, go on with your question? Hello, can you yes, hear me? Hello. Yes. Yeah, my question actually on uh, its title of the, the, uh, the title of the play, uh, Hamlet wakes up late. Yes. Why waking up late now? Oh, no. Oh, yes. I guess that I, I, I'm muted. Anyway. No, uh, I hear you. Um... Uh, what's waking up? represents on on Hamlet actually does it represent the stupid or stupid per, uh, thoughts of Hamlet or and if you uh, if you want to explain it in general the the stupidness of the of the Arab uh, governmental systems or something like this so yeah Hamlet doesn't represent oh sorry I mean, does Hamlet here, accor according to this title, is naive or stupid? Mm. Thank you. He, yeah, he wakes up late in the sense that, in the sense, okay, so. The last one to know anything. He's the last one to know. We'll start back in Egypt. We'll start with Tawfiq al-Hakim, who you might've heard of. He has a novel called Audat al about how the spirit is going to return to the Arab lands and they're going to have a revolution. This was 1952, he was foreseeing, maybe. And then Gamal Abdel Nasser came and said, yes, I am the revolution that Tawfiq al-Hakim foresaw. And then after, after Nasser's death in 1970, Tawfiq al-Hakim wrote a memoir, a very angry little book called Audat al Wai, The Return of Consciousness. The idea was under Nasser, we were all like under a spell. We were all like mm, in a trance. And now our consciousness is going to return and we are going to be able to think critically again. So this Hamlet, he's the last one to think critically. He doesn't understand why things happen. He understands that his mother married his uncle, but he doesn't understand that the kingdom is being robbed and making peace with the enemy. He only, this is a very leftist play. And so when he says consciousness or waking up, he means it in a kind of Marxist sense of understanding the deeper reasons behind your unhappiness understanding the ways in which society and economy and politics are broken. Um, and so, and yes, absolutely, Ahmed writes in the um, chat, the hero of the play is the unnamed actor who is a socialist and who's also every man, the kind of the man in the street. He is really one of the very few positive characters in the play. Um, so, so that's what waking up late means. It means understanding only your personal problem and not the larger social and political problem that shapes it and structures it. I want to jump to Maram's question, if I can. She typed in the chat, um, do I really think that Ophelia committed suicide? And she asked me this question also before. So she really wants to know. Um, but I want to know your opinion about this, since you are so interested in this question. Mm, I don't know. I, I don't believe that she committed suicide. Um, I don't believe this idea. I don't know why, but I, I really don't believe it. Do you think she fell or do you think she was pushed? I think she was pushed by someone. 
It's very possible. There is a version. So Jawad al-Asadi, who is an Iraqi um, playwright and director, he lives in Beirut. He, his Ophelia is killed. She's pushed. Um, it's very possible because Claudius, when he sees her doing her crazy thing in her mad scene, he says, follow her close. Give her good watch, I pray you. And depending how he says, and he sends a guard after her. Yeah. Depending how he says this, she's becoming very dangerous to the regime. She's saying completely inappropriate things about Hamlet and maybe soon also about Claudius and about his marriage. She's, crazy people are very dangerous. Yeah. Um, so yeah, if you want to read it that she was killed, you can. If you want to be really dark about it, um, listen to Gertrude's speech when she's telling about the death of Ophelia. It's such a beautiful speech. It goes on for like five minutes. Why? It's completely inappropriate to the situation. Why does she have this beautiful speech ready to go about the river and the flowers and the trees and the water and the dress? Uh, right? It's a little suspicious. I, so I, I see why you think what you think. My, my idea is that uh, it could have been an accident, but also the, uh, if it is an accident, it would be the, simpli the most simplistic of interpretations for, uh, for Ophelia's death. If it's suicide, this is what I had in mind, uh, then this is an act of resistance. She just killed himself. And this is the only way women could speak. I, I'll kill myself, so I don't know what happens to you after me. Uh, you feel sad, whatever. Uh, uh, and I, I quote uh, the book, uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the author, Overheaded Body by Elizabeth uh, Bronfen. Uh, it talks about death, femininity, and the aesthetic, how usually women are associated with death. They bring death and they also Die. And then one of my students suggested this idea that she could have been killed by Claudius. And then, oh my God, this is mind blowing. And it's possible. But, but what you're saying here, you're adding even more depth to this by saying that even Gertrude is complicit because her speech is in many ways like uh, uh, Claudius's opening speech. It's, uh, it's so perfect that it seems to be uh, not improvised, well prepared and well rehearsed even. And it doesn't fit the situation. Yeah. No, I, I'm bothered by this. Many painters, of course, British painters are not yeah. bothered by this. They do the opposite. They make these beautiful paintings of drowning Ophelia um, because it's a very picturesque description yeah. that Gertrude yeah. offers. But I agree with you. If she kills herself, the grave digger makes a joke. He says she drowned herself in self-defense. It doesn't make any sense, that's why it's funny. How can you kill yourself in self-defense? But it, it speaks to something in her situation that yeah, her death could be a protest against this system that will not, where she can't speak her truth. She can't be herself. Suleiman al-Bassam, when he adapted Hamlet, I, this is a little sensationalist and I think in poor taste, but he made her a suicide bomber because like that, she kills herself in protest. Um, I, I don't think it's the best choice for Ophelia, but it was certainly very, uh, very striking. Okay, guys. Do we have more questions? Shema wants to know, why did Hamlet not commit suicide? <laughs> this is an interesting question. He, he thinks suicide is haram. He thinks the everlasting set his canon, put his divine law against self-slaughter. Yeah, that, exactly. Ophelia drowning. This is the artistic tradition that people have made. And Sir John Everett Millay is the most famous about these pictures of Ophelia drowning herself. 
Yeah, Hamlet does not kill himself. Um, you know, if he did, there would be no play. So how interesting is that? But also at the end, Horatio wants to kill himself. He wants to drink the poison cup and Hamlet says, no, that would be the easy way out. And you have to take the hard way and tell my story. Which is so selfish. Oh, totally. But he's totally selfish. He's never that, yeah, He's self-consumed. I wanted totally. to ask something really quick. And I don't know if we, have, if we have time. Sorry, I always jump in like, because I'm, I'm too excited. Okay. I'm okay, Rafat, you tell me how we're doing. <laughs> I, I can answer another couple of questions. By, so Rafat, by, by the way, it. it's okay. By the way, I took like several uh, screenshots and I'm going to ask my students to do memes. So on you holding uh, maybe, or I don't know. So I'll, I'll be sending some, uh, some of these memes. I have very, very creative students. They are meme masters. Yeah, no, I, this, this is wonderful. And it's great to meet all of you and uh, hear some of you, hear some of your questions and concerns, especially the places where you're angry at Shakespeare. Because, of course, I'm angry at Shakespeare too sometimes. Everybody is. Okay. Uh, I, I read something that's in, uh, in Bloom. That's Harold Bloom. That's it. He yeah. said that um, Hamlet's, Hamlet is theatrical. He, his theatricality is contradictory with his sense of self, with his inwardness, with his consciousness. And like, uh, I don't know, like, I don't get it. How? Well, like, how can theatricality and being I mean, being good with a theater contradict being aware of yourself and your, your, your life. Do you do theater? Yes, I actually went to the States uh, a couple of months ago. I was in the States and I took two theater classes. But they so, also, the, the, my the, this class is the, the, some of the most evolutionary uh, uh, students we've ever had at the department because, you know, we have very few students and we have so many uh, male students and so many female students. And we usually, that's the girls always take Shakespeare because, you know, we have uh, separate education uh, students in different classes. Uh, uh, so uh, we had the annual show at the English department and the boys uh, had, a, 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 they had their own play with everything, uh, how we always offer Shakespeare to the ladies, but we don't offer the class to them. And Abdullah was one, uh, uh, one of the guys who did this. So they, in a way, the play was the thing wherein they, in a way, made they us caught your conscience. give them Shakespeare this class. Yeah, we caught, it, we caught the yeah, conscience. I don't, I don't think they believe that teachers have conscience, <laughs> but that was fun. But this is, this is amazing. That's because we all uh, uh, talk about how significant literature is. And I was like, uh, uh, with Michael at the head of the department, we were like, there has to be a Shakespeare class for the boys this time. At least they did a play on this. We reward That's them. That's amazing. Yeah. So is this a combined Go class? On, Sorry for the interruption. Rafat, so is this a combined uh, co-educational uh, class then? It's only online, but back at university, we have the ladies in, in our class and the boys in uh, one class. And what do you do? You lecture the same on thing video class. link? No. Uh, uh, or different online. times? Online, it's the same. everybody is uh, online together, but at, back at university, uh, I give the class early in the morning uh, uh, for the boys and then an hour later for the, the ladies. So two classes, same same thing. But it's so interesting online, because we have little. Uh, but now, yeah, we're coming all online. We're united here. Yeah. That's amazing. And also, I can join you. I told my uh, friend, "Oh, I, I'm sorry, I'm busy on Monday afternoon. I'm giving a lecture in Gaza." <laughs> Completely surrealistic. You know, um, I, I, but I, I want to answer Abdullah's question because I think it's interesting. Okay, um, go 
so my approach to Hamlet was largely inspired by Harold Bloom. In I went to university where he taught at Yale, and I was too scared to take a course with him because he was very famous and old, and I was intimidated, which was stupid, but I didn't. So I came two times to hear him lecture, even though I was not enrolled in his course, one time about Othello and one time about Hamlet. Um, and so this idea that I believe in strongly that Hamlet is looking for the right script to express who he really is. And he wants to reject the scripts that are handed to him by others, by other father figures. It's a development of Harold Bloom's idea um, that what Hamlet wants is to express his own self-consciousness. He doesn't know what that means exactly, what that is. Uh, because all he's been given the opportunity to do is to play roles written for him, scripted for him by other people, not to script his own. Um, you can see an example of this when the actors come in Act 2, Scene 2, and they come, they say, um, they, they give, the head actor gives this speech about Hecuba about the fall oh, yeah. of Troy. Mm. And Hamlet says, oh, if I had as much reason, he's, he says, um, Is it not monstrous that this player here? Yeah, 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 thank you, exactly. He, go ahead. In a dream of passion could force his soul so to his own conceit that from her working all his visage wand, distractions in his aspect, a uh, uh, broken voice, and all his function seems to suit to uh, things, his conceit. I forgot it, sorry. Yeah, no, it's good, exactly, yeah. So he says, he, and then the players leave. Yeah, he says, what's Hecuba to him or he to her, that he should weep That he for should her. weep for her, yeah. What would he do had he the motive? The motive and the, the passion. The for passion I that I have. He would drown, would drown the stage, stage with tears. And then later, so a little later, he, mm -hmm. he tries it. He says, um, if you go down a little, he says, I would have fatted all the region's kites, flip a page forward, with this slave's awful. And then he tries it. He tries to sound like that um, character that he thinks he should be. He says... Bloody body villain, remorseless, treacherous, lecherous, kindless villain. And then he says, Why, what an ass am I? This is much praise. He says, What an ass am I? And that means in that moment, first he's um, criticizing Claudius, he's insulting Claudius. Claudius is the bloody villain the treacherous, lecherous, kindless villain. He's giving a good speech against Claudius and he hears himself giving this speech and it sounds fake to him. It sounds phony and insincere, inauthentic. And he says, oh my God, I sound like an ass. So that is the moment of Hamlet overhearing himself and his theatricality coming into conflict with his authenticity. Does that make sense? Oh, wow, it does. So I'm if you perform it that scene. way, I, I've seen yeah. it performed that way. Julian Lester performed it that way. But I've always read it like that, that this, because I'm influenced by Harold Bloom, who says Hamlet overhears himself. This is what makes Hamlet so special. In this, scene, yeah. you can see him overhear himself, and you can see him take up a position and then drop it because it looks ridiculous to him. Yeah. I've seen Ian McKellen do this and it was mind blowing. It's online. Yeah, it's a great speech. It's a very strange speech. He's in the in this speech he um he orders the play. He agrees that the play is the thing, but he's already ordered the play in the previous scene. 
So it's very strange, but it's, it's powerful that you get to see Hamlet think. And so I think actors really enjoy it. Should we take a last question from Malak who has had her hand up patiently? Okay. Is that okay? And then I should go. All right. So hello everyone. I'm so thrilled to be here. Um, well, my question is like reaching the point that, uh, that Horatio wanted to commit suicide and then Hamlet stopped him because he had to tell his story. And you know, storytelling is an act of, of existence. Like I exist, I have my story. So do you believe that Horatio told the story properly and honestly? This is a wonderful question. Many Arabic adaptations start with this. They start with um, Horatio as the Hakawati, who has to tell, oh. the story, right? Who has to yeah. retell it and you understand that this is his version of it. In Shakespeare, we don't get to see it. Um, we don't get to see how Horatio would tell it. Exactly. I think he's not going to tell it properly. I think everyone in this play, um, everyone in this play has a theory about Hamlet and they're all wrong. Everyone has a story of what's wrong with Hamlet and they're all wrong. Fortinbras puts him on a stage at the end because he thinks he was heroic. What? Yeah, like a soldier. He's never been a soldier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He should get a soldier's burial, which is, of course, completely inappropriate because he was not a soldier. So, um, you know, Horatio says, yeah, I'll, I'll tell of these things. He says, put him on a stage and let me speak to you of carnal, bloody, and unnatural acts, of accidental judgments, casual slaughters, of deaths put on by cunning and purposes mistook, fallen on the inventor's heads. He sounds like he's, a, he's selling something, you know? It's too exciting. It doesn't sound tragic enough. So I don't think he's going to tell the story like Hamlet would have told it. That's I why I believe we have to write our own stories and not to trust anyone to tell our stories. Absolutely, yeah. Don't wait till you're dead to see how your friends will tell it. Do it yourself. I totally agree. Yeah. One more point to support your argument about Horatio not being a reliable narrator or storyteller. The way he framed uh, Fortinbras, he yeah. said he is of unimproved metal and he's trying to do this and he's like, basically he framed him as a bad guy. And then when Hamlet sees Fortinbras, he says the tender prince. Yeah. Now, which one do we believe? I think, can I, can I say something here also? Uh, we discussed this extensively in class, the issue of framing, how Fortinbras was uh, framed first. We had an, a, a bad a, a idea about him for the negative framing in yes. scene one as a hot uh, person leading uh, mercenaries, uh, a group of mercenaries with, you know, people uh, hungry for just want to eat, just want money, etc. And then he, Fortinbras was framed to us uh, by uh, by Hamlet, of course, Hamlet doesn't know him personally, but in a way, Hamlet sees himself in 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 young Fortinbras, the the young delicate prince who is leading an army for a plot, and I'm doing nothing. My mom was whored, my dad was killed, I lost the crown. This is where later on, we, where he for the first time talks about his ambition to be king. Early in the play, it was here here over his, his mother's over hasty marriage and. Uh, her, her father's uh, 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 murder. Uh, my, my, you, I, I have never said this to my students. And in my mind, I usually have, uh, uh, what's his name, sorry, uh, Horatio as the villain. Horatio has all the way been behind everything. Probably he conspired with, uh, with Fortin Brass. He planned this, there was no ghost. The ghost was a, a, a trick by, by Horatio. That's why in, in the chamber scene, his mom didn't see the ghost because there was no ghost. Hamlet was hallucinating, uh, uh, actually. But the, the first ghost was, in a way, uh, a play on this. Because at, also at the end of the play, Fortin Brass was the winner. Uh, he, he got everything. He w won everything. And also, uh, Horatio got to tell us 
uh, uh, the story. I like Horatio, but usually I feel that he was, you know, like I, the most fascinating thing about Shakespeare and, and Hamlet in particular, I tell my students, if you change one facial expression, like when Hamlet dies and Horatio just, you know, like does a particular facial expression, he changes the whole play. And this is mind blowing in itself. What's amazing is that there's so much space in the play that you could do that. Excuse me, that is my telephone. Dr. Rifat, this is grand treason. <laughs> Why don't you tell us about this? I was, I was keeping it for the last. I did not know that you are a fan of conspiracy theories. I, I know, not. yeah, this is very dark. It's the biggest conspiracy theory ever. I am not. The, the, what I, you know, when you eat uh, chocolate, you'll keep the, 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 the sweetest for the last. This is what I'm doing here. <laughs> oh, but you spoiled it. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, uh, we're sorry we're keeping you, uh, uh, probably this is uh, lunchtime. Uh, so oh, it's been wonderful to talk with all of you. We should have done this much earlier. Uh, same here, well, yeah. You know, like I was, I had email. this list early in the course. I, I had this list or like to talk to a group of people and when the Corona thing, I was like, oh, all my plans failed. And then, oh my God, everybody is staying at home. So this is, uh, this is cool to do. It's perfect. Uh, uh, not sure if anybody uh, uh, anybody wants to say something very briefly. Just liners, so we don't keep uh, 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 the great Margaret Litvin uh, uh, late here. But Rafa, before go on? That, I just want to say your students uh, uh, have my on. slides. They have my email, and please. Uh, feel free to write to me if you have questions or if you need sources for some research you're doing or you need ideas of um, plays to write about or whatever, um, I would be happy to be in touch. Okay, yeah, so, so we'll have now? Rahaf and then a final note from Margaret. Go. Okay. Can I speak? Yeah. So actually, Dr. Rifat always does that, the conspiracy thing and, you know, putting people, things that are entirely unrelated to me, relating them together in, in one way or another. Like, I remember we had a lot of arguments during poetry class because he did this. Um, about the idea of Horatio telling the story or Hamlet, I don't know why I feel this way, but I would actually trust Horatio more to tell the story, then I would trust Hamlet because Hamlet is just so inconsistent, always. He, he's saying something, then he's doing another, then he's saying another thing. So I don't think his story would be really reliable. So you don't think he's objective enough? And of course you can't be objective about your own story. I also don't think he, this is a matter of inconsistency. I think it's more a matter of maturity. Hamlet was, was growing up. I know many people trash Shakespeare for having two Hamlets, but Shakespeare wants to have two Hamlets because there was the young, you know, university guy, uh, a dreamy prince, and then later on after, and then we spoke about this journey of initiation going to England, and this also going to England itself, how England, changed, even a journey to England changes uh, people. And this, we talk about the psychological archetypal image of the, the, the sea changing here. The, the sea changed him. Even later on when he came back, there was very uh, rare mentions of his dad. And he declared that this is I, Hamlet, the Dane. So I don't think this is a matter of inconsistency. This is more about growth, about maturity. We have a different Hamlet. A Hamlet I, I told my students before that this is a boring Hamlet because this is a Hamlet who believes that there is uh, uh, in the fall of a sparrow, there is uh, providence in the fall of a sparrow. He's submitting to, uh, to you know, to his religious beliefs. Uh, but again, this is a grown up Hamlet. You know, I, I agree with you. And this is actually how I started my book, saying that between that it, on the either side of this voyage, he travels and he returns and he's different and he makes a journey. But actually the first thing he does when he gets back from this voyage is, he, not the first thing, but he jumps into Ophelia's grave, like, like a clown. So 
And he gets into this whole fight with Laertes, which is completely unmotivated and silly. So he's not, yeah. he's not so serious. Yeah, I, I also think that way too. Okay, final note? Mm, no. Thank you. Margaret, thank you. Thank you all so much. Your students are lovely and I love how they think for themselves and they're not afraid to argue even with you. This is That's why I like, I like them. You know. Yeah, so That's enjoy. Some of the best students I've ever seen. No. Right, so we'll listen to that's just one minute of advice into Shakespeare or something if you want to, to tell them something how to approach Shakespeare what to do what's next advice. because we're also doing oh, we're doing Othello um, yeah no this is hard with the with the advice um, I had my students, when I taught a course on global Shakespeare's last semester, I had them actually write their own adaptations, very short ones, just a scene in some genre, like as if a situation comedy on television or as if a pop song or as if a play using Shakespeare's characters and relocalizing the story into a different setting. Um, I think it's fun to do. It's fun to give yourself that freedom to think like an adapter and to think, well, what are the resources in this play? And what are the problems? What still works today between the characters? Um, and just try to play with that, adapt it, not to treat it. The worst way to treat Shakespeare is like, you know, the great classic Shakespeare, um, because this is really boring. So I think that's all the advice I have. But if you have specific questions, um, or again, just want more Arabic Shakespeare plays to read or whatever, uh, please shoot me an email. And thank you very much for letting me uh, visit your class. We lost you. I'm here. Did you lose me? Have we lost you, Margaret? We can't hear you. No, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, now we can hear you. So thank you very much. Alf Shukur, uh, like, uh, Okay, you type Alf Shukur, so thank you very much. <laughs> You've been amazing. Uh, it's like, it's been eight years of, of, of waiting for a class like this. And I, 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 I'm sure uh, we can do more uh, sessions in the future, maybe next year, next semester. Sounds uh, good, let's not wait eight years amazing. until we I'll, do the next I'll give uh, the slides to my students and I'll, I already recorded this. I'm going to post it on YouTube and uh, send it to the students who didn't attend uh, the class. Uh, so the, 